Alabama to begin a 54-mile march to Montgomery. It was a peaceful demonstration against the systemic racism that figured the engulf the Jim Crow South and a call to action for federal voting rights legislation that would ensure African Americans could not be denied the right to vote. But their peace was met with violence. Police and local citizens attacked marchers attempting to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, including the late Congressman John Lewis, whose skull was cracked by troopers. The barbaric images filled newspapers and were broadcast on television, and that is how the day came to be known as Bloody Sunday. That was 58 years ago, and after all this time, the issue of equal access to voting is still unresolved. The 2023 legislative sessions have begun uh, in all but two states, and state lawmakers have introduced a record number of restricted voting laws. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, since the end of January, state legislators have pre-filed or introduced 150 restrictive voting laws that would make it harder for eligible Americans to vote, and 27 election interference bills have been introduced as well. One glimmer of hope, lawmake, uh, one glimmer of hope that we see, is lawmakers in at least 34 states have proposed 274 bills that would expand voting access. Restrictive voting laws often disproportionately impact voters of color, and there are currently 150 attempts and counting to make it even worse. Joining me now is Judith Brown Dianis, a civil rights uh, attorney and the executive director of the Advancement Project's national office. Also with me is Wendy Weiser, vice president for the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. Welcome to you both. Uh, so, Wendy, uh, this is a record number of restricted bills that have been introduced uh, so far, and we're just in March. <laughs> so what can we expect for the rest of this uh, legislative uh, year and the rest of the calendar year? Well, um, it, it is really concerning. Actually, these bills were only as of the end of January. More have been introduced even since then. And there's a real surprising risk that a lot of these are going to pass um, in Georgia. Um, we, we just saw a bill to ban all mail drop boxes in that state go barreling through the legislature. So I think that this is going to be a continuing push in about half the country. We have seen in recent years, half the country over the past couple of years continuously put in place um, barrier over barrier that makes it harder to vote. And on the in other states, we're now seeing efforts to make it easier to vote and improve the election administration process. So you, you have this sort of uh, balancing act, I, I guess, Judith, in, in some respects, uh, to note Wendy's last point about you have states that are trying to uh, put more, um, you know, open-minded laws on the book with respect to voting. But many of these bills are likely to become law. A lot of these bad ones are. And, and what happens when they do? How do they change the landscape for voters? Well, Michael, it's, um, it just becomes, it becomes becomes more difficult for voters to participate in our democracy. You know, today I'm here in Selma, Alabama with the civil rights community um, because we know that our work is not done and that what is happening is a power grab and an attack on our democracy. And it's really a three point or a, a triple threat to our democracy. First, People have gerrymandered in the states to maintain their power for decades to come. Then what they do is they pass these restrictive laws to make it harder for us to vote. And they have packed the courts with judges who are eviscerating our voting rights protections. And so this triple threat to our democracy is something that we should be really concerned about because we're on the eve of another election, 2024. And we know that January 6th was an indicator of how far they will go to maintain their power. And so we're going to see these restrictive laws passing um, because we know that we turned out in record numbers in 2020, and they just want it to be harder for us to turn out in 2024. Wendy, uh, J Judith makes a, a number of interesting points there in terms of how this landscape uh, is evolving, and, it, and it's largely because Republican legislators especially have really figured out how to capitalize on the loopholes that we see in a lot of these state laws, uh, voting laws. Uh, 
How do you counter that, a strategy like that? What, what is the way to sort of, you know, stop gap against uh, filling those loopholes with, uh, with these types of laws? Well, that, that's a great question, and it's getting increasingly hard for the reason that Judith said, that the courts and the U.S. Supreme Court in particular has been systematically um, cutting back on eviscerating protections for voting rights in American law. There are two very important cases that are pending before the Supreme Court right now, one that could really um, further threaten the remaining provisions of the Federal Voting Rights Act, the historic law that was passed as um, in the wake of the attack in Selma, Alabama. Um, and we're seeing um, a, a, an attempt to just completely eviscerate the accomplishments of those brave Americans in the Voting Rights Act. And another case that will actually make it harder for state courts and state constitutions to rein in abuses of power by these state legislatures and we are seeing so many of them. And I should add, they are having a negative impact. Despite the fact that we are seeing historic voter turnout, it is not the same for all voters. We are seeing an increase in the racial turnout gap. So in Georgia, for example, where turnout went up by several points for white voters, they went down for black voters, despite the fact that there were actually prominent African-American candidates on the ballot for statewide office um, in both political parties. So we are seeing real concerning impacts, um, and we are, we are trying to study how this is, um, how much of an impact this is having, but it is not, um, it, it, it is not a, um, it is not a welcoming environment right now for voters in much of the country. And two other things to note is there's also an increasing climate of political violence. And we're seeing not just January 6th, but harassment of election workers and election officials who are making it easier and, um, and more seamless for people to vote and participate in the election process. And we're even seeing state legislatures make it easier for partisans to meddle in election administration and vote counting processes. So the threat is really quite significant right now. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, Judith, uh, what Wendy just laid out, particularly with respect to how this is impacting um, uh, black and brown voters. What is your message to those voters? How, how do they gird themselves against this system that's being set up to deny them their access to the ballot box, particularly as we, we talk about, uh, the, you know, commemorating Edmund, uh, the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge and, and all that went into securing this right to vote? What should these black and brown voters themselves be uh, prepared to do? So, first of all, we need to know that uh, these tactics, while they seem like they are, and this is what the Supreme Court said, it's like, you're getting equal opportunity to vote. We're taking drop boxes from everyone. But we know who that impacts the most, right? We know where the long lines are and where drop boxes help, right? And so we, um, we know that it's not fair that we have to jump over higher barriers because we are black and brown voters and because, because we're stepping into our power. But here's the thing. We have to stay the course. We know that the demographics of this country are changing. We know that young people are seeing themselves in solidarity with one another, and that the work that we have to do is continue to push on Congress for the Voting Rights Advancement Act that is named after John Lewis. Two is the Biden administration has increased opportunities for voter registration, and let's make sure that we register to vote and that we turn out in record numbers, because it is only a matter of time before this democracy is inclusive. We cannot ignore the numbers if we show up and we vote. Judith Brown, Deannis, and Wendy Weiser, I thank you both for this uh, very important conversation. So CPAC has wrapped up with the Republican Party's de facto leader closing out the conference last night with a keynote speech. Up next, Donald Trump's message to America. Spoiler alert, it's bleak and it's super weird. I mean, like, weird. Another hour 